Hey everyone, welcome to the ARW Sunday Discussion. I am Billy, and uh, today we're going to be talking about drill bits and drilling and sharpening and everything uh, making holes related. Uh, we got several gentlemen here uh, who want to share this information with you, so let's get started. Who wants to go first? Yeah, I'll go first. All right, All right. Mark. <laughs> let's get started. Let's go first. Well, I'm no expert at drilling, uh, but I've learned a few things, uh, mainly just uh, starting the holes. Well, I'm no expert at drilling. Oh, somebody's got their YouTube on. Uh, mainly just starting the holes. Billy, is that you? It's not me this time. <laughs> you got your YouTube up. Get it, get it shut down. Billy, is that you? Hello. It's not me. This it's, it's not me. <laughs> okay. Anyway, uh, am I echoing now? Me. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I am. Anyway, uh, I'm going to mute myself. Hello? Yep. Hey, did it work? Yep. Oh, good deal. Anyway, I'm no expert at drills or sharpening. And I've got questions myself, but the one thing I've learned is uh, starting holes and how to keep them centered. And uh, if you don't mind, Billy, uh, share the screen there. All right, one second. Um, let's see. Why can't I share this? It says remove. Oh, there we go. You're sharing? Yep. Okay, I, I was using the center drill for quite a while for uh, my starting drill, and then I got to investigating, and spotting drills actually work a little bit better. Uh, what you get if you go too deep on a, uh, a center drill, you get this right there, uh, the left picture, and the sharp edges of your drill bit pull your drill bit around. Uh, you can use a center drill for uh for a starting drill but but you need to go really shallow but that was a you know i always wondered the difference between a spotting drill and a center drill and uh kind of answered my own question uh but that that was a big help to me uh go ahead and quit sharing if you want okay my back yeah Okay, uh, but uh, the spotting drill that I use is a solid carbide, and that's that's my go-to drill. It's quarter inch. Uh, I occasionally use the center drill because the very tip of your center drill is the correct angle. It's uh, 120, I think, whereas your regular bit is 118, and it it centers centers your drill really well. That's about all I got to offer. Uh, all right. Okay. I muted some of you guys. Uh, whoever figured out how, who, who had your YouTube up, if you got that closed down, you can unmute yourself now. I think that might have okay. been me. I'm really sorry. All right. It happened to me a couple <laughs> I just weeks just copied ago. the link over to post it on my channel. Uh, okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. Playing. I'll jump in for a minute there, uh, Billy. All right. All right, so my suggestion is uh, if you guys haven't used these for thin uh, metal, you know, sheet metal or just or just thin materials, the, these are awesome uh, because they, you know, they support themselves as, as they're drilling the hole. And, and as a lot of you have probably found out, if you're trying to drill, if, you know, if it's a, a decent sized hole in a thin piece of sheet metal, you'll end up with a triangular shaped hole because the, the, the bit will, will walk itself around. These work really good for, for thin materials. Um, the only thing I would suggest though is use a small pilot drill just to get it started because uh, yep. the, the tips on these are not not very sharp, but uh, they do a great job in, in thin materials. Yeah, I love using those. The fact that they uh, don't have the spiral flutes on them keeps the material from uh, pulling up on the bit too. Yeah, and they have they have them. This one's got two flutes, and they have them with a single flute uh, for for soft materials like aluminum. The single flute I like a little better, um, but but either one works really good. 
Yeah. Uh, electrical contractors you like using those for enlarging um, holes in the uh, boxes and stuff for conduit. Yeah, 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 and and they work good on like square tubing and so forth too, where where you're going through a fairly thin uh, uh, material. Yep. Tell you, tell you what, they work good on plexiglass too. Yes. Excellent. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Uh, if you're grilling a real thin material like sheet metal, I saw a trick one time where you can wrap a piece of cloth around your grill bit. And it'll keep it from wobbling around. It'll make a straight hole in, in sheet metal. It also works up supposedly for aluminum and soft materials as well. Um, yeah. I, I was told, though, that it's just better to spot and then drill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, now that I have a lot of step drills, I'd rather use them than wrap a piece of cloth around <laughs> around a drill. But if you don't have them, that's a little trick that'll help you. Yeah. At um, one point in time, I was drilling on my little Craftsman drill press. And I was drilling that cheap uh, aluminum bar that you get from Home Depot or Lowe's. And all my drills, all my holes were coming out um, triangular shaped. And I thought there was something wrong with my drill. I thought the, something was wrong with the, the, the chuck. You know, I was doing all kinds of crazy stuff. And finally just, you know, made my peace with it and quit using it and moved on with my life. Come to find out it wasn't anything with the drill. It was my technique. Never knew. <laughs> So I, I've become a big fan of uh, spotting drills. Uh, it took a while for me to to uh, become a convert, but th there's a 120 degree uh, spotting drill. So I use these to start uh, 118 degree drills, and that has been that's been a real uh, uh, a real help and get everything to behave. I, I drill I drill a lot of holes when I make my uh, my balancing rings and what I do is I send the spotting drill down until I get the the diameter of the chamfer that I want and then and then when the drill comes in it's it sends it all the way through so uh, yes you either, you're either going to spot the drill or you're going to use a, a 135 degree uh, drill that's been relieved and those you can just send and, and that's also a very, you know, getting 135 degree relief uh, drill in carbide is is like a religious experience because uh, on the CNC, it, you just go and it's it's done. Yeah. Um, hmm. I'll bring myself back and go full screen here. <laughs> so I recently picked up a set of these. Um, drill hogs, drill bits. They are molybdenum uh, M7s. Uh, they're stubby length and they're split point. I absolutely love them. Um, but I found that I started um, uh, galling up and messing up the shanks on them. And I've made several mistakes. One was you don't use these in hand drills. You just don't because apparently the hand drill, you can't get the chuck tight enough. And I'm starting to think that my uh, drill chucks in my drill press and the one I use in the Bridgeport both are cheaper ones that you can't get tight enough either because I've had them slip in those and every time they slip it, it screws the shanks up and I have to go dress them with files or um, the stones or both to try to get them back into some semblance of order and it's really irritating me. Um, I never had this problem with the, the cheap Harbor Freight ones. <laughs> <laughs> they don't slip. They don't golf, they just don't drill worth the crap. Um, so I'm a little disenchanted. I was hoping that these were going to be the magic, you know, magic bullet for my problems, but the fact that they're slipping is, is, is making me, you know, is aggravating me uh, greatly. And I'm, I'm curious uh, what you all have, uh, any suggestions on that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, okay. Oh, sorry. Hey, I, I got one on that exact subject. If you want to zoom in on, on me, uh, Billy. Sure. Hold on. Uh, dang, that's fine. There you are. Okay. So, you know, I've got a couple of these Makita, but I think all of them pretty much use the same uh, uh, chuck. I think, I, I think these are, you know, some type of Jacobs chuck or whatever. And when I first started, when I first went to the keyless, you know, the, the way I would always use it, I'd put the drill bit in, you know, and, and uh, run it down. 
and until I, you know, until it slipped and I would call that good. Well, I found out and I, and I probably the only one on the planet that didn't know this. <laughs> Once the drill motor stops, there's some kind of a clutch that engages and you can crank it down some more. And that makes all the difference in the world. So maybe that'll help somebody. That's, uh, you know, I know that. And that's what I was doing. I mean, I was, I was honking on those things pretty hard and I was step drilling. And I think um, that my size of steps were not uh, correct because every time I'd start to drill in this uh, three eighths inch plate, it would, it would catch even with, you know, on the, on the drill press even, I, I don't know. Um, I think it's just bad chucks all the way around. I don't think that anything wrong with the drill bits. I think they're just a little bit harder and therefore not getting in the, you know, getting a good grip. And, uh, <laughs> there you go. Put one of those on there. <laughs> all there and cut. Yep. Hey, Billy, when you say you're step drilling, uh, how big of a step are you doing? At that one, I was trying to do a fitment. So I was just going up for each size and that was stupid. I know. Yeah, I think a big problem that people have when they when they go to larger drills, and this is one of the things I was going to talk about. Um, actually, the guy who taught me uh, said, "Oh, you know, just go out by eighths each time." And the problem with that is, is there you're only drilling a sixteenth of an inch on each end of the drill, and you're going to burn up your drills super fast like that. Uh, so when I go with a silver and deming bit, a, a reduced tank bit, all you really need to do is put a pilot hole that's wider than that chisel point on there. That's where all of your pressure is happening. So you drill out that material and the rest of it just goes like butter. Um, the, uh, uh, you do have to slow it down. So let's say you had a one inch drill in mild steel, you wouldn't want to run that at 360 with the uh, with the pilot hole because it's going to squeal and chatter. So I usually cut that in half. Um, but uh, um, definitely do not do the classic step drill where you're going up by eighths or even quarters because you're just going to burn up that last tiny little bit of your cutting edge and you're going to burn up every single one of your drills. Um, the other thing with reduced shank bits, and this is something that people always um, uh, they try to stick them in a in a half inch chuck. They say, "Oh, it's got a half inch shank. Let me put it on a half inch chuck." That drill chuck capacity is actually the size of the drill, not the size of the shank. Uh, right. Especially keyless chucks, they self tighten. Uh, so if you um, uh, if you put a one inch chuck in there uh, or a one inch drill with a, a reduced shank it's going to self-tighten and all that extra torque is going to potentially damage your chuck. Um, keyless chucks have the little ring of thrust ball bearings in there and you can break them. They, they snap in half and they feel like gravel afterwards. So, um, uh, you know, you just have to look out for that. Um, reduced shank bits, I always just hold them in collets. Uh, you get a lot more purpose on them. Um, you're not going to spin them. Obviously, if you're... Uh, if your shank is already totally hosed, then you're not going to be able to put them in a collet. But uh, uh, I have a I have a set of silver and deming bits that I um, uh, that I keep nice and pristine um, that I only put into collets. And same thing with work. Um, I bought one and said, "Do not lend these to any other shops. <laughs> right? Uh, keep these nice and pristine for us." Um, Sorry, I got a lot of show and tell. Is that okay? Go ahead. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Although, uh, let me let me take us back out for just a minute because um, sure. Joe with uh, Sierra Specialty Audio Auto uh, just joined us. Hey, Joe. Hello. Hey, uh, Joe. Good to see you. Want to make sure that everybody knew that uh, new face. Hi, Joe. You haven't been on here before, have you, Joe? Uh, one time. Uh, one time. Okay. California Special Edition, and I was on for that one a couple of months ago. Okay. Well, I listed you as a new face, but uh, you're still kind of new. <laughs> I didn't remember you. I, I do apologize. All right. I'm going to bring Stuart back up here. All right. Um, so I've got, I do a lot of stuff for spotting, uh, but my go-to is this guy. This is a, a really stubby 90 degree split nut or um, spot drill. This one's a Keo. Um, they're nice because they're really short, of course. 
Um, and the great thing about using these 90s is you can drill in deep enough and, um, and leave that chamfer uh, that you want on the finished hole. Um, so especially if you're going to tap afterwards, you can save a tool change by using this, drilling in deep enough to leave your chamfer, um, and then you drill your hole and you go to your tap rather than spotting, drilling, countersinking afterwards, and then tapping. Uh, always put a chamfer on before you tap. Um, I also have this stubby little, this is a 118 degree, I think, spot drill. And then, of course, you know, you can use uh, center drills. One experiment that I've been wanting to do with these guys is seeing if the spot is more accurate if you just kiss it a little bit and just put the little dimple or if you actually drill in a little farther and let it get into the cylindrical or the tapered section. Um, that's something I've been meaning to test for a while. Um, as far as my everyday drills, I've got fractional sets in both jobber and sub length. Um, screw machine length, I've got those in 135 degree split point. Uh, the others are 118 degree chisel point. Um, uh, generally that 118, you've got a, a longer cutting edge. So they're, uh, they resist wear a little bit more. And that's why you see specialty drills for abrasive metals that might have a 140 or, or um, um, 140 is really shallow, but uh, 90 for cast iron, for instance, um, uh, because you get a longer cutting edge and it's not gonna wear down as much. My one to 60 set is all uh, stub length. Then I've got my metric. I've got my A to Z. Um, I also have a set of um, jobber length bits, fractional size, that are specifically for brass and copper. And I've shown these in a few of my videos. Let's see if this comes up on camera. Come on, focus. Focus. <laughs> um, the way this is, there you go. You can see the cutting edge has been ground flat. There's zero rake on it. And this is great for grabby metals. Uh, so brass, copper, uh, sheet metal, plastics actually. Um, you just touch those on the grinder or even with a sharpening stone and they're not gonna wanna grab and the part won't auger up the drill bit like you normally get with uh, the sheet metal and some of the grabbier metals. Um, of course, uh, taper shanks are a much better choice for larger drills than the reduced shank bits. Um, and if I'm going to do a really big hole, I'm going to use an annular cutter. Um, this is the kind of bit that you, uh, that you use in a mag drill. And I bought this. Um, this is actually going to be in the video that's coming out tomorrow. Um, I got this on Amazon, and it's a special holder for the annular cutter. Uh, there's a guide pin that goes through the, uh, the the cutter there, and there's a spring in this area here. Sorry, I don't mean to flip you all the bird, um, but that spring lets the guide pin eject out the slug that's left over in the annular cutter. Um, you can just hold these in an end mill holder or a collet as well, but you're not going to have anything to eject that slug. Um, of course, annular cutters are far superior to hole saws. Um, plus you're left over, uh, you get left a little slug of metal that you might be able to use for something else. Um, uh, let me see. Um, oh yeah. Um, old carbide end mills. Uh, whenever I break one, I never throw it away. Um, I have to drill out broken studs all the time at work. Um, so I just go over to our carbide grinder and I dress them into a really quick and dirty drill point. And, uh, and if I screw up that broken carbide end mill, no big deal. It's already a broken carbide end mill and it'll go through that hardened stud or broken center drill or whatever. Uh, no problem at all. That's a great uh, idea. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that's all of my notes. Sorry. I kind of monopolized the time there. <laughs> I wanted to go over. Um, so I want to talk about, uh, you know, uh, Mark talked about center drills versus spotting drills. And, you know, a lot of machinists use the, the, use the center drills in lieu of the spotting drills or doesn't really care which way to, that they go. Um, in class, I specifically use the center drills, but I, I do something kind of sneaky. Um, I pick the right size um, center drill and um, 
typically I'm drilling a hole so that we can tap it with a quarter 20. So I'm, you know, I'm picking that, uh, that number seven out. And I spot it in such a way so that they, they can get, you know, they, the point of that 120 degree on that um, uh, center drill uh, is what the point of that uh, number seven is hitting. But we also bury it enough so that the uh, upper cone of that uh, center drill leaves a nice chamfer. So you can do uh, two steps at once. You get your center drill and you get your chamfer so that when they finish drilling their number seven, we can come back through and tap it and have a nice uh, chamfered hole all in one shot. Um, but it's a little bit, bit of a technique. You gotta get it just right. If you go too too light, you, you don't get your chamfer. If you go too deep, you get a huge chamfer. So I try to show them you know, how to get their, how to set it and do that kind of thing correctly. Um, if I'm viewing other kinds of drill or holes and stuff, I'll just barely kiss it with the uh, uh, center drill or I'll switch out to the spotting drill. Yeah. One, uh, one other thing about center drills, they actually sell these in different angles. So normally it's 60 for a center drill, but you can get them as combined drills and countersinks with a 90 degree chamfer. Those are really great for starting holes that are going to get tapped. Yeah. All right. Let's see here. Who's up next? Who haven't we heard from? Harold, we yeah. hadn't heard from you, sir. All right. Let's go. <laughs> I, since I have a drill doctor, which uh, for some people that's a cuss word and others it's a great thing. <laughs> I've learned that uh, you can go from 118 to 135 degree tip or anything in between with the drill bar and i've tried the 135 degree tip and for me it seems to drill faster and straight so i am sure there will be a lot of objections to that probably and one of the good things that a, that a hobby should keep is a, a drill speed chart because a lot of times I see I see uh, videos from people drilling way too fast for the size of the drill bit. I start off like that a lot of times myself. And one last thing is on these center drills, be careful where you buy them. I bought some off of Amazon the other day. They came in and the, and the smallest two or three, the actual tip of it is going around in a, a circle. You know, when I, when I put it in the drill, and I had to check it three or four times to make sure I didn't have it all set in the jaws. I'm bad about that. But this thing actually, a little tip just wasn't in the middle. That's all I got. All right. So, yeah, um, I have a uh, drill doctor there at the space, and I keep it hidden on purpose because I don't want the lay guy coming in and trying to use it because there is a finesse to using that drill doctor. Even after you've read the instructions, you still have to tinker with it a little bit more and learn you know each drill bit is different and i found that you know you put it on that 118 setting not for the angle but for the when you're setting the flutes um, if you don't set that just right you don't get your back break on your drill bit so i found that i almost always have to go to the extreme to get the uh, relief angle on that uh, on the drill bit um, and i have to show people how to do it and uh, let them screw up a drill bit or two before we finally get it and of course, every time you sharpen it, you thicken the web out a little bit. Um, but fortunately, they do have the uh, splitting feature. So you can actually split point, at least mine does, you can split point your drill bit. And that kind of uh, works pretty well for that. Um, it's not like a factory split point, but it, it, it works pretty good. All right, let's see here. Uh, we hadn't heard from uh, Giles yet. You got something? Yes, sir, I do. All right. <laughs> Ex-military, I make notes. Um, okay. <laughs> I've got a whole bunch. And I'd like to start backwards, actually. I go backwards in time here with this, this whole drilling thing. Um, drilling is the fastest way of quickly removing material when you're doing machining. And I think Stuart's going to back me up on that one. Uh, <laughs> Especially, of course, if you're using annular cutters, which do not remove the majority of the material, they remove just the perimeter of the material, and, this, and then you know, you'll end up with stuff that it looks like this. And that's the little knobby that uh, Stuart was talking about that you end up with. And you can make all kinds of cool stuff with this. But all that aside, there are three 
uh, general things that people need to know about uh, before choosing a bit uh, for a particular task. There's the material that the bits are made of, the coatings or lack of it, and the geometry of the, the drill uh, uh, angle. And of course, there's the helix, but that, we'll leave that aside for now. So if we uh, just look at the material aspect of it for now, you'll have uh, essentially three types of drill bits out there that you can choose from. You got your sp general high-speed steel. Um, and if you start by, if you start by using uh, or choosing something that is uh, M2 in hardness or better, uh, you'll get something that's worthwhile for your money. So uh, then there's uh, high-speed steel with a certain percentage of cobalt, uh, and then you have carbide drill bits. Now, uh, let's say you're looking at high-speed steel bits. Uh, there are high-speed steel bits out there that are coated. So let's say, for example, with a black oxide. Um, and those, uh, you wonder, okay, what does black oxide do? Well, essentially what that does is it takes some of the heat and, and offers a, additional lubricity to the, uh, to the drill bit itself. So it'll last a little bit longer. On the other hand, you could have, sorry, this is my reaching, a, um, just one of these high-speed steel shiny types. I, I love these jobber types. They're a little bit bigger. Of course, you should keep it as short as possible, but I love these. If you get them in really good quality, high-speed steel, they're fantastic, but uh, not really recommended for the folks out there that have been doing CNC. They'll probably want to stick around, with, uh, stick to uh, carbides. Now, this is where I'm going to sort of blend the uh, material with the geometry. Uh, with, so far, we've only been talking about 118 degrees uh, and 135 degrees primarily. Uh, and those is what you'll most likely uh, uh, find in, in the market for general purpose drilling. Uh, and, so, and 118 is perfectly fine. It's, you know, uh, you, you can resharpen them yourselves, high-speed steel, make yourself one of these puppies, a drill guide sharpener. And uh, Bob's your uncle, and start learning. So that's a good thing to do. Now, as far as um, say uh, drill bits with cobalt um, and carbide, something that I learned from uh, Haas Automation, H A A S Automation. They're on YouTube. You should check them out. They've got a great video on basics of drill selection, and I. Heart, I truly recommend that you watch this video, all of us, uh, including the pros. Now, this, for example, high-speed steel with uh, M42 with uh, M cobalt uh, in it has two different types of, of coatings, uh, uh, titanium nitride and uh, just a black oxide coating. Now, uh, something that's interesting about the, these bits, they're 135 degrees, and they are self-centering. Now, uh, tough for me to, to uh, show you why, but essentially, you've got the, the points of the drill bit in the center are <coughs> offset, and it offers the drill uh, the ability to self-center. So if you're using one of these bits or a cobalt drill, they're nearly all of, nearly 100% of them out there on the market now are self-centering, and you don't need to use a centering, uh, a centering bit in order to use them. Very cool trick to know about. And it, uh, why do they do that? Of course, is because uh, in automation work, they uh, it reduces the amount of time of tool change. And uh, you know, if you're using the right bit for the correct, the, the, uh, a certain material, it actually speeds up and uh, provides longevity to your drill bit. So, so those are some really interesting things to know about. Uh, now, what what is good for what when you're talking about geometry? A 118 degree drill bit is usually really good for mild steel or anything that's a milder 
uh, type of material. Jobber type drills are great for that. 135 degrees are really great for harder steels, alloy steels, stainless steel, etc. But the only thing uh, that that would be the exception is, of course, stainless steel, which is a, a sticky material to deal with. And there is where you would want to choose a helix angle that is uh, a lot different, such as a 10 degree, that sort of thing. Um, yes, so I'm trying to read the comments as they go through here. Um, yeah, it's kind of difficult to do. I'm not that fast. Uh, so, the, uh, I do have a question about the coatings. Um, yeah. I'm going to interrupt you for a second. I never Please. like coatings because I figure once the drill bit's dull, I got to sharpen it, and there goes the coating anyway. What good's the coating going to do if I, you know, if I'm sharpening it, I end up grind, grinding the coating off? Right. the uh, The coating at the tip is not necessarily uh, the only part of the coating that is useful because when you're talking about the uh, you know, your, your, of course, your tip is what's used to, to plunge into the material and actually drill into it. But the, uh, when the chip formation occurs, the coating itself, uh, certain coatings are um, good for uh, transferring the heat buildup to the chip versus being uh, concentrated on the drill bit itself. And, and so even though you sharpen the drill bit, of course, it reduces its longevity. But you still retain some of the functionality of the coating. And uh, uh, say the, only, the only thing that would be uh, an exception to all of those is titanium uh, aluminum nitride, which is really, uh, it's, <laughs> it's not really good for, for uh, in the same way as it is for the other coatings that are on there, because that's a very specific use type of coating. But, um, if you're not dealing with, look, if, if you don't want to spend a whole load of money, uh, a bright general purpose, high speed steel bit is still a really great choice as long as you, you know, buy something that's worth your while. So for yeah. example, uh, I bought a set of <laughs> drill bits. I have not is there that. something wrong with that? <laughs> There is. That's for doing that, that, that left angle, you know, that left angle hole you got to do, right? <laughs> yeah. Look, I'm Canadian. We play hockey here and I wasn't intended on using drill bits, but maybe I should. Uh, 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 this is the difference between buying a good set of drill bits um, and versus a cheap one. Now, uh, <laughs> these bits, oddly enough, I purchased from KBC Tools and granted, they usually offer me great service, but selling us crap like that is not good service uh, it, selling it at all is not good so you know i'm 60 years old i've never seen a freaking bit bend like this so that's crap i'd rather have it break than bend because if it bends it can't be reused there's no way if it breaks you can resharpen it and just put it back to work right so uh, so if you're looking at a kit, for example, I've got my show and tell too, uh, like this, and you say, hey, man, I'm going to get every drill bit, you know, all the letters, all the numbers, etc. Yeah, you will. But um, keepers, you might be better off going to Princess Auto, as Everett's saying there. Um, buy, like, buy small kits like what Stuart has. You'd be much, much better off. They'll be, they could run you, say, between $60 and $100 per little kit, but you'll get some quality bits. And that is like, just like a, um, a spring loaded punch where I would spend money to buy a, a stair. Um, drill bits is definitely where I invest money because it's worth it. Um, it's the performance, the longevity. Uh, plus the precision of the hole that you make, uh, you know, cheap bits will get the puck in the net, but it may not drill the hole very straight. <laughs> so anyway, that's my two bits on, on uh, the basics of drill bit selection. And I think uh, it's worthwhile. I'll repeat it again. Go watch the basics of drill selection by Haas automation.
those, it's it's not a promotion thing. It's truly like a, a a learning tool video that they have. Well worth your time. Yep. Well, thank you, Giles. Um, I think next up, um, Steve, you look like you're raring to go. <laughs> you muted. So can I unmute you? Anyway, we've kind of beat the uh, spotting drill thing to death. And I, I do use the carbide spotting drills. I've got a set from eighth inch through three eighths that I use. Uh, Stefan Gotzwinter has a, a very good video on the spotting drills and it's really worth looking at. Uh, but what I'm gonna talk about here since we've kind of beat the rest of it to death, I do use a drill doctor for smaller size drills. I'm going to say three sixteenths through maybe five sixteenths. I'll use the drill doctor. Under three sixteenths, it's almost not worth trying to sharpen the darn things. Uh, they're so cheap. When I buy them, I get them from Master Car, and if I need them, I buy a half a dozen at a time. And when they're gone, they're gone. And you end yep. up using the shanks for dowel pins and everything else. Yeah. But uh, the thing I want to talk about now are micro drills. And there's my little set of uh, micro drills. I probably have six or seven of them. And this is number 61 through 80. And a number 80 drill, I think, is 13 and a half thousandths. Obviously, you don't sharpen these things. No. But I do a lot of modeling. And so primarily, the, the micro drills are used in either plastic, uh, wood, uh, brass, and aluminum. Rarely do I ever use it in, in steel. And I've got a, uh, a, a micro adjustable all brick chuck for them if I wanted to mount them in a high-speed drill press. Uh, that's the key to it. it, it you've got to get the speed up on them. The other thing that I do with the micro drills, I use beeswax as a lubricant. And it seems to work real well. It, it works well on the miniature taps also when you're doing O like an uh, O size, double O taps. I use the, uh, the beeswax on that, that works real well. And the other thing that I use with the micro drills are the Starrett pin vices. And I've got quite a collection of them from the smallest to the largest. And so you end up doing a lot of the uh, drilling with these little micro drills, like I said, normally in, in softer materials and you're actually doing them by hand with the with the pin vise. All but right. I know that uh, uh, Michelle there from Rustinox had asked the question, what do you do for sharpening small drill bits? And my basic question answer to that is I don't. <laughs> But for the larger size, my grandfather on my mother's side actually was a tool and die maker. And one of the few things, the lessons that I actually got from him was how to sharpen larger drills basically offhand and do it by hand. And I can get a pretty good, pretty good edge on uh, the larger drills, three eighth and larger, just doing them offhand. If I could tag on to what Steve said uh, about the small drill bit, I, I agree completely. Uh, I have on my wall, I have small small drawers for drill bits. And the rule, and plus I have a, 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 a complete set, a good, a good quality master car scale set. And if, if I break a drill bit, I buy three. So yeah. my rule is break one, buy three. So if you think about it, 
you, you bought this index, you broke one. So now you, you go to McMaster car, you order three. If you order it before four o'clock, it's here the next day. So one, one goes back in the index and two go up on the wall. So the next time you break it, you have a spare on the wall and you have one more, right? And you order three. I figure by that time you should figure out how to stop breaking those those uh, drill bits. <laughs> but uh. but and I don't have the full index in my drawer. It started with uh, you know one of those arrays of, of little drawers, blank. So you break a drill bit. Now you get one drawer labeled for that drill bit size. You, you buy three. Next time you break a drill bit, you you order three. You get a new drawer and your things are white. My drawer is uh, probably one, two, three. I probably have 12, 15, 20 sizes of drills uh, on the wall in addition to the index. So there's no, it's false economy to try to, you know, sometimes sharpening is just not worth it, uh, especially with the master car and, and especially with robots. So uh, that, was, that was one thing I wanted to, to agree with. <coughs> But break one by three. Uh, <laughs> Good advice. Thing, for, for micro drilling, as Steve pointed out, you know, if, you, if you're doing those tiny drills, you need to know about uh, PC board drills because there's a whole industry out there making uh, printed circuit boards and drilling little tiny holes, like on the order of ten thousands and twenty thousands, uh, and they have a whole family of carbide eighth-inch shank. Uh, PC board drills, and some of them have a lot of length to them, uh, you know, length to diameter ratio, and they're not super expensive. And oh boy, do they work! Um, I have a project. Actually, I just realized it's standing in front of it. Uh, yeah, sure it is. I had a project uh, like this that's aluminum, okay, and this is a vacuum table, a little, a little six by six inch uh, vacuum table. So there's, you know. I forget exactly what the number is, but that's on the order of 1,000 holes, uh, probably about uh, three eighths of an inch thick uh, aluminum. 2020, uh, yeah, this is 2024 aluminum, and that was all done with one drill bit. And I was nervous as hell about it, and I literally sat up, uh, is sit, sitting in front of the CNC machine because I was absolutely sure that it was going to break, you know, on the third hole. And I wouldn't know it until it got to the end, the last hole. But in fact, when it was all done, I pulled that drill bit out and I put it under the microscope and I could not distinguish it from brand new. And that was one of those, uh, you know, PC board carbide uh, uh, drill bits. Now that, that drill probably cost me, I want to say it might've cost 10 bucks. And, you, and he's like, whoa, that's expensive. No, it's not expensive. <laughs> so, your money's worth out of yeah. that. Yeah. And then, and then I, I continued to use that same stick and drill bit for, you know, for a long time until one day, of course, you know, the inevitable happened. But uh, look into those PC board drill bits if you're doing teeny holes. Um, yeah, I have a full set of them in the carbide, and they were very reasonable. Yeah. They're, and they're, they're reasonable because there's – PC board business is so vigorous because of computers yeah. uh, and other technology that there's a lot of volume. Um, I wanted to. I want to also. I had two more items on my list that came up during the discussion. One was uh, I'll get this out of out of the way quickly. Cap Magic makes this extra thick, and I do mean extra thick, uh, gooey um, cutting fluid, which is which is awesome. For drilling and tapping, um, highly recommended. Uh, and finally, I, we started got into the chucks. We started talking about good chucks, bad chucks. Um, I decided that in my shop, the uh, the Jacobs chuck number eighteen N uh, is sort of the standard, you know, machine chuck. Uh, and I figured out how to rebuild them. And one of the things that I, I learned. Is that the jaws? This is this is a jaw, one of three out of out of uh, Jacob's 18N. Um, they frequently get chewed up, 
especially if you spin a if you spin a drill, or if the person who you bought it from spun their drill. Uh, and I, I came up with a, a fixture for securing all three jaws. And this is this, this fixture was accurately made uh, with with you know wonderful perfect holes, um, and then a little lip, a little lip for the jaws to land on. And if you have to manually you have to manually get them rotated right, and then there's a set screw. But once they're all in this fixture, they go on the on the grinder this way, and you put it on your sign plate to get the angle right, and then you can go ahead and regrind uh, all the flats. On, on the chuck drills, and what I found out is, after you do this, you put you put your your chuck back together. It's like a miracle. Uh, it, it works really well, nice. and you're good for another 20 years or so. Which could 20 years of abuse can happen in a week, but uh, you're, you're kind of done with that. so that that was my little adventure into. Uh, rebuilding the James chucks, and I sort of again I sort of standardized on the 18N, which is which is what do they call it? They call it three thirty seconds to three quarters of an inch. So this is for big stuff. Yep. All right. Awesome. Uh, I don't think Joe's Billy, got to go. Billy, might just if I, if I may, I just have one real tip, which I think will be useful to well, pretty well anybody out there. Um, have you ever had, you know, and well, everybody has this happen to them. You're drilling through some, a piece of metal and then you get right to the end of it just before you break through and your drill bit breaks. Do you know why that happens? Well, I'll tell you why. The, essentially what happens is that the heat generated at the very end is all applied on that very tiny piece of steel, which is very slim and, or thin. And uh, in some material, it'll actually harden the material. Uh, where, and when your drill bit goes through, it'll break. So the, re the way to resolve that problem is quite simple. Before you reach that end, as you get close, reduce the speed of your drill bit by half, 50% and then complete the drilling operation to the end, and you'll find that you will never break a drill bit again. I just thought I'd throw that out there. That's a great tip. Yeah, you see that when you're drilling through steel and those last few chips come out colored, everything yes. else is silver. That's um, right. I find too, as soon as I feel the tips start to break through, you'll feel the pressure drop way down. Um, and I'll baby it through that last little bit and I get a lot less of a burr on the backside. If you just sit yes. there and punch it through, you can get hellaciously large burrs on the backside of steel. Yeah. 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 Well, we've actually learned a lesson from our CNC brothers on that. And that is peck drilling. I was going to say, yes. we need to yeah, talk about it's, drilling it's a great things. idea that the drill bits last a lot longer. You build up less heat use a little bit more lubrication that way and uh, particularly if you're drilling on the lathe or something along that line because you have a tendency to put a little bit more pressure on the drill bit in a lathe than you would necessarily in a drill press because you can't feel it quite as much yeah, yeah. yeah. plus the flutes tend to pack up also yes yeah well we hadn't heard from joe so i'm going to put him on the spot um <laughs> <laughs> and then I want to talk, if we get enough time, I do want to talk about drilling techniques, such as peck drilling and such. So uh, let's let Joe go, and then we'll talk about the techniques. Okay, I showed up a little bit late. I'm not sure whether uh, anybody might have covered uh, this particular type of drill. Uh, in my business, restoring hydraulic brake cylinders uh, for people with old cars, I, I was boring holes oversized just by a little. Uh, for instance, a one inch cylinder would get bored to one and one sixteenth for a sleeve thickness, uh, wall thickness of one thirty second inch. So I used core drills and I bought, I have these in sizes from, uh, I think, three eighths of an inch up to over two inch. You can see they're, uh, they're not 
uh, sharpened in a manner that would allow them to start a hole. You can only enlarge a hole. Uh, most of them are four flute. This particular one, inch and a sixteenth, uh, I've probably drilled, I don't know, 10,000 cylinders with this. Uh, the one inch, uh, tremendously common size. Uh, and they're available in uh, big, big boy drills. Uh, again, wow. they don't <laughs> they don't start a hole; they enlarge a hole. Uh, I gave some of these to uh, Stan Zinkowski for for Black Betty. We may see them show up on on his channel. And and so uh, there's an interesting uh, thing about doing uh, cylinders. Uh, I might do. Uh, an inch and three quarter master cylinder uh, using, uh, in that case, inch and seven eighths core drill for a wall thickness sleeve of one sixteenth. So I need to be an eighth inch oversized. And then when it comes time to drill the compensating or bypass port, now we're looking for, as Steve said, uh, 28 thousandths of an inch. That's a number 70. And if you have to go down into the reservoir, because the cylinder is three inches deep, the reservoir is three inches deep. So you have to get down through the filler cap hole down to the top of the material around the bore. So they make these, where's the, there we go. They make these holders in, uh, 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 number uh, wire drill bit sizes this particular one again number 70 and that's about a 3 16th shank so you can put this in your chuck and get down into the bottom of a deep hole and so the, these are uh, tremendously handy if you do have to drill a small hole down in a deep feature wow and that's nice. my contribution <laughs> well, thank you. Good, good one, Joe. I got a whole bunch of those uh, core drills from a guy on Craigslist a couple of years ago, and I've never gotten to use them. Mine aren't uh, solid, though. They're they're actually uh, uh, interchangeable. So I have a holder, and then the core mm. drill itself is maybe only an inch and a half or so. It's got a, a Jarno taper on the end with a little square shank. Uh, kind of fits into a slot in the holder to keep it from spinning. And then there's a bolt that goes through it as well to hold it in place. Um, I, uh, I I haven't needed them, but I couldn't pass them up. I, I, they were they were a hundred bucks for probably wow. fifty or sixty core oh drills. It was an awesome deal. Wow. Yeah, yeah, that's a good deal. I have no idea where to get replacements. <laughs> <laughs> well, so we've talked about drills and sharpening and drill chucks and such, and we've touched on drill techniques. Um, of course, you all mentioned peck drilling. Um, and how useful that is. Anybody else want to expand on uh, different types of techniques to get, you know, deeper holes, more accurate drilling, um, and that kind of thing? Uh, one, th one thing I would comment on, Billy, is uh, uh, stainless steel. Um, and that may apply to some of the tool steels also. Um, but uh, if you're drilling stainless steel, once you start, you got to go. You can't you, you, you can't dilly dally around. Uh, you got to just you know, get good a good uh, steady pressure, get a good chip going, and just continue on. Because if you if you back off on your pressure, uh, it'll usually you know spot harden, and and, and then you're going to have a problem. So what I'm hearing there is don't spot drill when doing stainless. Or don't 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 uh, peck drill while doing stainless. Oh, you can peck drill. Yeah, it's just when you're drilling, you've got to keep feeding and, or, or or stop completely. You just you don't want to you don't want to use a too low a pressure. Okay. I don't do a lot in stainless, so I'm kind of clueless when it comes to that. Uh, <laughs> I prefer mild steel and aluminum for my projects. Yeah, yeah you'll you'll work hard you'll work hard in some stainless steels, such yeah. that if you if, if you're like if you're on a manual machine. And you just kind of just pause for a second. You know, you maybe went from four pounds of pressure to half a pound of pressure. You know, check the clock, go back, and start to go. You're in trouble. Yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah, I can tell you, I was trying to make a stainless steel washer one time, and I started in with my uh, parting tool, 
And I got about halfway in and I paused. And then when I started to go back in again, it just ate the party to it. It already worked hard and that fast. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Well, you got to remember, stainless steel has very poor heat transfer characteristics. Very, very low. So if you make a little heat, that heat's not going anywhere. It's going to go away. So that, that's a very important thing to do is just to keep on going. That's one of the advantages that, you know, CNCs have is that when you give it a feed rate, it's it's doing that feed rate. And it, yep. it, it doesn't have any emotional investment. <laughs> when I was uh, making the uh, DRO for the uh, uh, quill on the uh, lathe, uh, I was modifying one of those um, uh, DRO slides and I didn't realize it was stainless, and I was trying to drill that with a standard Harbor Freight drill bit, and it started getting in there pretty good. It, it made a good, you know, eighth inch deep hole, and next thing I know, it start, it's, it's starting to glow and smoke. Um, it broke through, but when I pulled that drill bit out, it was um, kind of bell-shaped, and where it literally had melted itself, and I'm sitting there going, oh, God, what am I going to do now? I don't have any, and then I remembered I had an eighth inch um, carbide drill and I finished it out but that was my first experience messing with stainless not realizing that it was stainless that was not fun well the other thing yeah. you have to be careful with when you're drilling the stainless you'll get the hole in there but if you haven't done it correctly you've got it so hard now that you can't get your tap through it yeah right yeah. so you've got to make red. sure that you uh, you don't build up that heat you want to use lots of lubrication and like I say, if you're going to peck drill on and off, don't let it dwell <laughs> on it. Uh, because if you're going to tap afterwards, <laughs> you can put yourself in a world of hurt. Fortunately, well, that's me, where some was, coolant might help be helpful yeah, as well. Yeah. yeah. Fortunately for me, this was a through hole. But yeah, I absolutely agree with that. That would have been a that would have been a nightmare. Will the stainless anneal um, in your dealer? Yeah. Probably so, but you'd definitely need a heat treating oven, I would guess. Yeah, just because it has to cool off of a very specific rate. Yeah, it'd probably yeah. get a ton of warping, too. Yeah, I mean, if, yeah. if you had to, right? If you had to, you could feel it. But if you're doing a project and you go, well, all I wanted to do is drill a hole, you know, and now all the stuff is <laughs> Now it's a metal yeah. project, right? Yeah. See, Dennis Nolan has some information for us on drilling the stainless. He says it's actually welding to the uh, drill bit. Mm -hmm. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Because yeah. 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 it's so soft, right? It's a sticky right. material. Aluminum yeah. likes to chip weld, too. I've had, I've had that issue. That's why I don't like that titanium nitride. I found that it was actually worse with that stuff versus a uh, high-speed steel drill bit. Um, I don't know. I, I don't like, know if anybody else has had that issue. I, I would like to speak out against coatings. I know the coating lobby is going to deal I think for us, uh, coatings are a waste of money. Uh, you know, for the guys that are doing CNC work and they're trying to they're just bring everything right to the edge, coating can have a you know meaningful contribution. But for guys that are standing in front of a manual machine, I think coatings are a complete waste of time. I agree. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's usually what you do, right? So. Uh, Somebody we was add. asking about drill storage. And um, the hout boxes are pretty good with the drawers. and not terrible expensive. I made out like a bandit because when I was in business, I had a hardware <laughs> store that went out of business. And I bought their Hanson drill uh, merchandiser. And it's got drawers in it. And I can have 15, 20 of a drill bit in it, other than the real big sizes. I can only have three or four half inch ones in the display. Yeah. All right. Hold on. Guys. Put that back up there, Mark. I'll show them yours. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, yeah, and that's then, uh, fine for single drills, but when you got 28 inch drills, it's a different story. Then you can oh, yeah. put it in a box. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I like the Hewitt, uh, the, the drawers are, are really nice. Um, yeah. yeah. I think Equipto <laughs> makes some as well that are pretty nice. Um, 
I think that's what it is. I don't know. We might have some Hugh Adams. Um, question: Does anybody know about the 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 uh, the hex nut trick for uh, for grinding drill bits? Oh yeah, as yeah. The, the drill gauge. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah. Uh, uh, my my diesel mechanic buddy, you know, he he always keeps telling me this one. So if you're if you don't have a drill gauge, drill point gauge, or out in the field, you just put hold two hex nuts together, and that gives you your um, your hundred. Well, it's 120 degrees, but it's, yeah. it's close yeah. enough yeah. that you can use it for a gauge. Yeah. It works. Yeah. Right, guys. Before you end this, can I answer a couple of questions from the chat? Sure. Um, uh, Mick's workshop way back at 326 asked about high helix bits. Um, so, Mick, if you're still watching, those are generally for things that produce powdery chips that need to be evacuated. Uh, whereas low helix bits are going to be for more uh, stringy metals, so mild steel and something that's going to make long, long chips uh, that needs, that those would otherwise get packed up in there. And then um, uh, real quick, we were talking about lubrications, but we didn't really talk about things for plastics. Most oils will break down plastics, uh, but uh, use vegetable oil. Uh, mm -hmm. It's, uh, it won't break down the plastic and, uh, and, you know, if you're, I had to tap um, an absolute butt ton of holes in uh, in acrylic, and I used uh, I used vegetable oil for that. Worked great. Good tip. Good one. All right. Yep. Well, everybody, that brings us to our hour. Uh, this was episode number fifty-one. Um, next week will be episode number fifty-two, which will represent a complete year's worth of ARW. So you all stay tuned for that episode. Um, that's all I got, folks. Uh, you only Thanks, have everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.